my name is Adele Trezillo, and I'm professor and department head of animal science here at Penn State University. I'm filling in for Dean Rick Rausch today. Uh, we are excited to have you all here for our College Connections webinar. These webinars are designed to give you a unique inside perspective on the diverse programs, people, priorities, and partnerships here in the Penn State College of Agricultural Sciences. You may have noted that we are recording this session. You will find links to this and all past College Connection webinars, as well as registration information for future events on our college website by simply searching College Connections. Please note that it does take a few days to edit and post the recordings. I'm excited because today's session is entitled Direct from the Horse's Mouth, the latest from Penn State Equine Science. I'm joined today by two of my faculty members, Brian Egan and Dr. Bert Stanier, both members of Penn State's equine science team. After the presentation, we will have a question and answer session. First, addressing those questions that were submitted during registration. And then later, if you have questions that come up during the presentation, we invite you to enter them in the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen. Please don't put them in the chat. Please use the Q&A uh, option. It's easier for us to track them there. Before we start the presentation, I would like to introduce our presenters. Brian Egan is an assistant teaching professor of equine science and serves as the coordinator of Penn State's horse barn. For the past 38 years, Brian has worked with brood mares and assisted with observing and foaling of more than 200 mares. That's a lot of, a lot of lost sleep right there. In addition to teaching, Brian coaches the Penn State intercollegiate horse judging team, works with students on proper handling and training techniques, and guides students through the marketing, planning, and coordinating of our annual Penn State quarter horse sale. Dr. Bert Stanier is an associate professor in my Department of Animal Science here, and he teaches courses ranging from introductory equine science to advanced equine nutrition. He focuses on the horse as an experimental model, and his research interests focus on nutritional management, not just in the horse, but with the overall goal of improving health and performance in all livestock species. He serves as the advisor for the undergraduate equine research team, and he has been a proud member of the Equine Science Society since 1998, and has most recently completed a term as president for that esteemed society. So with that introduction, um, wasting no time, I hand it over to you, Brian and Bert. Great, thank you very much, Dr. Terzillo. Um, we are, Brian and I are honored to have this opportunity uh, to present to this group of participants. We're really excited to talk a little bit about uh, some of the highlights of the equine program at Penn State in the Department of Animal Science. Um, so to go ahead and get us started, I wanted to highlight the fact that as we put these slides together and thought about the presentation that we wanted to provide, um, we worked closely with Mrs. Andrea Coker and Dr. Danielle Smarsh to help in kind of putting this together. And the four of us are really just members of a larger team. You can see 11 of those individuals here that really serve the equine program here at Penn State. Uh, and in that way, our students, uh, and of course, the equine enthusiasts and professionals uh, across the state. Um, so we're going to talk about all aspects of that program a little bit today. And, and the way we've put things together is we're really moving from our youth and our youth programs and the education we provide to them all the way up through our undergraduate, our graduate programs, and on to how we try to uh, educate adults and equine professionals in Pennsylvania. We hope that those of you that are participating in this uh, walk away from this with a clearer idea of all the different ways that our equine team here at Penn State is uh, trying our best to communicate and to help the equine industry here in Pennsylvania and really uh, across the country. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand things over to Brian uh, as he focuses on our, our youth programs and the undergraduate program here at Penn State. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bart. <clears throat> 
Good afternoon, everybody. So I've been kind of charged with the idea of talking to you a little bit about our youth program and our undergraduate program here that uh, we, we put together at Penn State. Uh, it's, it's important to note that a lot of the people within our group that Bert pointed out, we all work together on all these all these opportunities for youth and for our students and for adults throughout the Commonwealth. So we work pretty closely together. And, and because of that, I think we all feel fairly comfortable in talking about each other's programs. The 4-H program and, and undergraduate education program really tie a lot together, and they always have, um, both on campus and off. And so it, it makes a pretty interesting conversation to talk about the two somewhat together for me. I also was fortunate enough to work in the 4-H program for a number of years, so I've been I've seen it from both sides, um, both the 4-H and the undergraduate programs. So 4-H programs across the board um, help to teach our youth responsibility. Uh, they teach them a work ethic. Uh, they give them an ability to learn how to take records and communication skills and all the life skills that we look for uh, to try to teach young people. And then when you add the horse into it, it makes it an even more interesting program. Horses are a very attractive animal to a lot of young people. And you know, young people that you know get involved in our horse program learn an awful lot about responsibility and they understand that no matter what the weather or whatever, they have to take care of their animals. So it gives us an opportunity to help them learn important life skills. But at the same time, we are able to start teaching science by using the horse as a model. And that'll carry through, not just through 4-H, but then also into their undergraduate careers. On a national level, 4-H is, is very well known and the impact of it is, <clears throat> has been shown and studied. Um, more specifically at Penn State, I think that the Pennsylvania 4-H horse program does a tremendous job of introducing new and, and unique opportunities for youth in Pennsylvania that you don't see in every state. Uh, we have a, a horse clover buds program that's relatively new, but it provides our younger youth between the ages of five and seven to start to get involved in 4-H. The, the interesting part about this program, I think, is that it's not just for youth that have horses or horse experience. A lot of the clover buds are, are getting started into the 4-H program and they're sharing horses. They're using other people's horses to develop that, that interest and to develop that, that first taste of the horse world, so to speak. We have a really cool program for our teen leaders called Team Horsepower. And the Team Horsepower kids are upper level teens that have have had some experience in our horse program and they apply and they get accepted and they learn a lot of really uh, important skills to help with leadership skills and communication. They learn about upper level horsemanship and how to teach those skills. They really become youth leaders in the program and they, they interact with the other youth in 4-H, they interact very closely with the 4-H staff and personnel at Penn State. They do come to campus a couple of times a year and interact with a lot of the people that are here uh, to, to learn about some of the, the more upper level skills. Also in Pennsylvania, there's the Animal Science Camp, which is across all species, but the horse camp um, provides horse 4-H youth an opportunity to come to campus for a weekend in the summer and work with our faculty and our staff as well as all of the staff from across the state. So the the interesting concepts that the Pennsylvania 4-H program has put out there has been a really a growing thing and tremendous opportunity for our kids. <clears throat> you can see on this slide just the number of opportunities that the 4-H program provides and you can see that it's not just showing it's not just competition but it's an opportunity for these students to to learn a lot of very important life skills leadership responsibility teamwork they, they do a lot of community service work students learn decision making they learn communication uh, and these are skills that these students will carry on and and take with them in their lives no matter which path that they they choose to take <clears throat> The 
combination of 4-H running through our department at Penn State and also our horse program is critical. Uh, in fact, for a lot of our undergraduate students, myself included, our first opportunity to experience Penn State is through the 4-H program, whether it be through a state dates competition or something else. Youth begin to relate to Penn State and our horse program while they're in 4-H. As far as on campus, uh, horses have been a part of our program forever, uh, so to speak. You know, horses were instrumental in um, the beginnings of Penn State as a university. Uh, in the middle of the, the upper middle picture of your screen is old Coley, who's a mule that um, rumor has it, I wasn't around, but rumor has it, he actually was one of the key components in helping build Old Main. Um, very famous mule. Um, probably wouldn't win any beauty contests if you look at that picture, but you know, he really did a lot of work here on campus. And the skeleton in the bottom is actually supposed to be old Coley. Um, and he's such an important figure in our history. We actually have the Coley Society in our college, uh, which is an honor society for our students. But over the years, horses have been used to maintain the grounds. Of course, the uh, agricultural background at Penn State was, was horse driven over the years. When we went purebred animals, they started with Percherons. We've worked through Morgans and Arabians. Um, and now we're into quarter horses is what we have here now. Uh, our quarter horse breeding program began in 1955 whenever Penn State acquired a yearling stallion called Sorrel Chief from Michigan State University. Um, we've had quarter horses ever since in 2010. Uh, the, the American Quarter Horse Association gave us the Legacy Award for registering registered quarter horses for 50 straight years. So we're in our almost 65, we're getting close to 65 years of having quarter horses. Um, old time stallions like Sorrel Chief, uh, like Poco Shade and Rebel Sir, Skip Sue, um, and more recently we had a homebred stallion, PSU Dynamic Crimson. Uh, have kind of blazed the path for the horses that we have here now. <clears throat> Nowadays, we have between 60 and 70 quarter horses on campus, and our facilities are really close to campus. They're within walking distance um, if, if students choose to do that, uh, and that allows them opportunities to get to the farm for different labs. Uh, outside of class, they can work at the farm. Uh, they can help with breeding and foaling. Um, many research projects are done at the farm. We have students that come and help work with horses as far as getting them prepared for the sale. One of our biggest events is our student run horse sale, which is a really a culmination of the entire year program for all students in our equine science program. This year we have a preview of those sale horses and, and the sale itself on April 29th. If anybody was interested in coming out and truly seeing what our students do, uh, it's a great opportunity at the Snyder Ag Arena to see the, not only to see the students work the horses that will be sold, but also to talk to students about research projects and clubs and, and all the activities that we have here on campus. Our equine science minor is just a tremendous asset to our overall program. Students can participate in any major across campus. Uh, and still be in our minor. Uh, we do have a lot of our animal science students that take our equine science minor. And with our equine science minor, our undergraduate program is developed to a rather large and extensive uh, opportunity for students. They have an opportunity to take classes in uh, equine marketing, but also advanced classes in equine reproduction, equine nutrition, equine exercise physiology. Uh, facilitated equine therapy. So students can take a variety of different classes to really augment their, their education. Uh, and through that, we have a lot of students that can leave here then and go on and, and take on jobs in many, many different areas of the industry. <clears throat> but the classroom isn't where all of our education occurs. We have a lot of opportunities for students outside of the classroom. Students can participate because we have our our stallions and mares, and we have our own foals born here. Students are, are involved with the breeding. They're involved with foaling. They're involved with industry because our stallions are, are desirable stallions and semen is shipped all over the country and students get to be involved in that enterprise. 
Students can show intramurally through our Little International, which is run through the Block and Bridal Club, which is a long-standing club on campus. We even have some students stay for the summer and, and work courses to show in the Pennsylvania State Futurity Program. Um, and then, of course, we have a lot of opportunities for students to do research projects and having the horses on campus, having access to those horses so close to campus allows students to get involved. And I think that that's just a great time now. I'm just going to um, kind of have a segue over from our undergraduate program and get more specific into our research opportunities. And I'm going to turn the mic back over to Dr. Stanier. Thank you very much, Brian. So again, I, I think that you all are probably seeing our video. Brian and I are sharing my office today. So he and I are working in here together today to, to go through this presentation. And, you know, it's really amazing to hear about all of that, the undergraduate programs that we have. And, and that's really where I want to sort of segue into but really we'll focus on some of the, the extracurricular activities and some of the other things that we do. I particularly focus on a lot of the research that we do here at Penn State, uh, particularly from an equine perspective. So we'll get into some of that. Um, before I jump right into that, I wanna mention one other uh, sort of coursework undergraduate class material that we have um, because Dr. Danielle Smarsh and Mrs. Andrea Coker uh, have made a real effort to begin to expose our students to international opportunities. So this is our one of our um, study abroad courses, uh, the Ireland's Equine Industry course, which this the pictures here are of the first class uh, that went over to Ireland uh, and really learned about the equine industry in Ireland and was able to compare that some to the industry here in the United States. I know that Dr. Smarsh and Mrs. Coker are excited about doing this course again, so this will happen again for our students and potentially also looking into some other venues uh, where our equine students may be able to travel abroad and get to see a little bit more of a worldwide perspective on some of the equine industry. So that's a that's a really exciting opportunity. Um, I have to say, so so this slide uh, really summarizes for me probably one of the things uh, that I get most excited about on a day to day basis. Uh, and these pictures represent this this student organization, the equine research team at Penn State, uh, which Dr. Smarsh and I advise. Uh, these are undergraduate students uh, that get involved in some of the research we're doing, and I think those of you that are participating in this webinar um, that are involved in the horse industry understand why it might take a team and again a team of individuals like this dr smarsh and i cannot do equine research by ourselves and so when i look at these pictures of the students that have participated in that team and that team has been present since about 2008 here at penn state um, i think about many late nights in the barn uh, collecting samples, caring for the horses that we're uh, participating with uh, in the research that we're doing. I think about the trips that this team has taken to Virginia and Florida and California and many other states across the country uh, to interact with other equine researchers, other students that are doing research, uh, and to communicate some of their research results. And I also see a lot of faces uh, that have become good friends of mine. Uh, that are students that have gone on to careers as veterinarians uh, and other equine professionals, uh, many of them moving outside of the equine industry. So as I look around this, you know, I, I do take some pride in where some of these students have gone uh, and the important uh, things that they're doing both here in the United States and even some of them around the world. Um, I think that what's really critical here is that students that are participate in the research that we're doing, that's outside of the classroom. So while Brian and I and everyone here on the team know many of these students from their interaction within the classroom, it's working with these students to do something special that we can do here at Penn State, and that is the research um, that really makes a university and their participation and their presence here so special. Just to give you a couple of examples of what actually happens with some of that research, this slide shows two examples of research studies that were conducted by undergraduate students here at Penn State. Uh, the first on the left hand side of this slide um, is something that is absolutely unique here to Penn State. No other place in the world would be able to uh, publish a study and do work on twin quarter horses. Now, 
we don't aim to have twins. In fact, that's not an optimal reproductive uh, outcome for horses, but every once in a while it happens. And we happen to have this set of twins here at Penn State um, and took that opportunity to study the growth and development of those twin foals. And in fact, have the only publication that you'll find in the world on the growth of twin quarter horses. And that research was done by two students who were undergraduates at the time, Patricia Ochansky and Sheila Zimmer here. Patricia has gone on to have a career in animal nutrition with Nestle Purina, and Sheila now works in the healthcare industry. Um, on the right hand side of this slide, uh, you can see some work uh, done on Tef Hay, which is an important forage resource uh, for people here in Pennsylvania. And this is work that was done by Jess Bussard and Natasha Rapard. Uh, Jess now uh, actually is the executive director of I have it written down here, Craft Malsters Guild, which is kind of interesting. She's gone into the craft brewing industry and sort of aspects of that. She's also an excellent writer. And the other one is Natasha Rapard. And they were great friends while they were here. Natasha now works for Highline North America, which is probably one of our country's uh, largest producers of uh, laying chickens. Um, so that's kind of interesting that they've both gone into various different aspects of the agricultural industry but also highlighting some of the research that we do here that has implications to the horse industry in Pennsylvania. Of course, we do more than just educate undergraduate students. We also have graduate students. Um, and so Dr. Smarsh and I and others work to train both masters and PhD students through our program here. And again, I've tried to provide two interesting examples of research that we've done here at Penn State um, that apply directly to the horse industry in Pennsylvania. The first of those on the left hand side here is some work that I did with Andrea Coker uh, when she was doing her master's here at Penn State. Uh, so again, Andrea Coker, you should recognize that name. She's also now the leader of our 4-H youth uh, equine program. And this was some work looking at how um, the thoroughbred growth sort of happens, uh, creating some percentile curves, and also thinking about how when a foal is born actually influences the way that they grow. Um, and that relates to skeletal development and development orthopedic disease and some of the, the problems that we see in the horse industry. So we wanted to study that a little bit more. And that's where Sarah Gray, with the second study that we hear, have here, was looking at how different diets may influence cartilage and bone development within our young growing horses. So we did this with our quarter horses here, but this research absolutely applies to all different breeds of horse. And this research helped us to better understand how we might feed, for example, diets that have higher sugar and starch contents and how that might influence cartilage and bone development. So of course, our thoroughbred industries, our standard bred industries are very important to us here in Pennsylvania. And this kind of research directly impl implicates um, some of the ways that we're raising those young growing animals to be at their absolute best from a performance and a health and a welfare standpoint uh, here in Pennsylvania. But of course, we're doing research now. So this last slide I have on research really highlights some of what's currently going on. In the top left-hand corner of this slide, you can see a video of our exerciser that we have here on campus. And this is important because it allows us very controlled experiments of exercise of horses here on campus. And that exerciser was built because of the support both from our College of Agricultural Sciences but also from individuals um, that donated to the program with an interest in enhancing our research capabilities here. You also see on this slide uh, some of the undergraduate students that we work with, the graduate students that we work with, and even some of the local equine professionals and veterinarians that help us with the research that we're doing. Our current research really focuses on gastric ulcers and subclinical inflammation. That's the area where we're focused right now. So, some of you that are listening to this might even hear from us in the future about some of that research and, and how we want to go forward with it. But one of the most important things that we do is we do this research to try to develop answers, to try to, to answer questions that the horse community has. And an important way that we communicate that research out is through our extension efforts. So this is where we're communicating with the adults, the horse enthusiasts, the horse professionals across the state. And this is where Dr. Danielle Smarsh is really in charge of our adult extension component of things. 
she focuses very much on using the research-based information that we develop here at Penn State and is developed at other universities to then communicate out to the community through things like webinars, social media, farm visits. Of course, we've got Ag Progress Days here in the top left-hand corner, and they cover a whole range of different topics. So things that, you know, again, she has heard and that the community communicates to us, things like, okay, what are the best grazing techniques that I should use? How should I manage pastures? Thinking about soil health. Of course, one that's become very hot lately, and, and I'll talk about a little bit, is, of course, our interest in parasites. So thinking about some of the worms and appropriate deworming techniques, and also tick control. So these are all areas where our extension efforts are really focused around things that are important for the horse industry here in Pennsylvania. That communication is not unidirectional. I think that that's something that is very important to relate. We work in collaboration with the entire horse industry in Pennsylvania. So not only are we helping to communicate information out, but we're also gathering information. We're working with horse owners and professionals across the state to try to move the entire industry forward. Uh, so on the left-hand side of this slide, you're actually seeing uh, some work that was done by a graduate student that worked with Dr. Smarsh to go out and work directly with horse owners. One of those horse owners is illustrated here, lunging their horse, uh, and find out how are horse owners exercising their horses on a daily basis? How are they feeding their horses? Um, how are they caring for those horses? And, and, and what are some of the different conditions so that we can feed that into our educational efforts? On the right-hand side of the slide, you're seeing some work um, that Dr. Smarsh has done in collaboration with Dr. Erica Mochtinger here. Uh, and again, another area that's very important uh, is, of course, um, ticks and tick-borne diseases. And those are important for our horses. So trying to understand best how we can reduce the risk of some of those tick-borne diseases. Um, this work has been going on for a number of years now. Um, and so again, you can see some of the resources that Dr. Smarsh and Dr. Mochtinger have uh, developed here as far as working with horse owners, collecting samples of ticks, asking them about you know, the situation with their particular animals and where they're seeing ticks, and maybe looking at some ways to help prevent some of the tick problems, looking at various different fly masks and repellents that can be used um, to help in managing uh, those ticks. So again, if you wanna learn more about this, you definitely want to uh, look at some of our extension resources. To highlight some of those extension resources, uh, this is kind of, you know, what are some of the, the programs that Dr. Smarsh is most proud of or, or focuses on the most? And those are kind of highlighted here. Uh, first of all, uh, fundamentals of equine pasture management. As I will highlight in the next slide, forages are absolutely critical to our horses, and Dr. Smarsh and her team definitely focus on pasture management. The new horse owners series is really important because we want to see new horse owners coming into the industry. And again, as Brian pointed out earlier with the youth, people don't always have horses or, or have the barn. We can't always see people face to face. So Dr. Smarsh and her team have developed a lot of online resources through some of their webinars and various different series where people can participate and learn information about the horse. So you're seeing that in the top left hand corner of the screen. The registrants that the pie chart that you see there illustrates the, the black area of that pie chart are registrants from Pennsylvania. But I also want to point out that there are people from across the country that are participating in our equine extension events um, that are coming into these webinars and learning from series such as this new horse owner series. And finally, of course, part of extension is doing things in person. There are some things that you just have to do in person. Um, so fun things, right? Like fecal egg count workshop. So in the bottom left-hand side of this uh, slide, you can see a bunch of participants that have come in to learn about um, how to do fecal egg counts. And when we do those fecal egg counts, you're looking at uh, the eggs from worms or parasites that are present in those fecal samples. And horse owners learn about dewormer resistance, anthelmetic resistance, okay? They learn how to do the fecal egg counts in those particular samples um, and learn about how to appropriately manage their horses so that we don't see growing resistance to dewormers. So again, all of this is information uh, that our extension efforts are trying to get out to horse owners. 
This last slide is again, you're sort of finalizing some of those extension efforts. And as I looked around this slide, I realized that there is such a focus of both the horse industry and the forage industry. And so I just did some quick math, sort of thinking about, well, you know, how important are those two industries to one another? People ask all the time to all of us, well, how does the horse really contribute to the agricultural industry uh, in Pennsylvania? And I just want to highlight, there's probably around 225,000 horses in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is in the top 10 states in the country as far as horses. And those 225,000 horses are probably consuming, and again, I just did some quick math here as a nutritionist, around 600,000 tons of forage annually. Okay, so I just want to illustrate that again, 600,000 tons of forage on an annual basis. The relationship between our forage production and our forage producers in Pennsylvania and our horse industry is absolutely critical. And that's why Dr. Smarsh and her team, you see Laura Kenny here, uh, focus very much on pasture management and also on hay and hay quality and helping both forage producers and horse producers to speak with one another and to understand one another. They do that through in-person workshops and pasture walks, but also through online infographics uh, and various different sessions. So again, this is how we try to sort of communicate some of that really important information. So that sort of wrapped things up from us. It, it really takes us, hopefully you've learned a little bit about everything from going from our youth and, and how we're trying to educate those all the way up through a little bit of history about the program, how we train undergraduates here, some of the opportunities that are presented to them, how we work with graduate students and their training, and then of course moving on to the horse professionals and adults that we reach out to. After all, a university really is all about education, and I think we, we work very hard to try to develop the knowledge uh, that we can use as a basis for that education and then do our best to provide those educational resources um, to all of you uh, that are participating. So again, we're very honored to be able to do that. And I think Brian and I are going to go ahead. We did have some questions that were submitted um, before the start of this. So we're going to we're going to answer a couple of those questions uh, and then we're going to sort of see what kind of questions you all might have from the question and answer session. I'll highlight at this point while Brian and I are answering some of these and I may have to stop sharing my slides for a moment to get to those. Um, you all can go ahead and continue to put questions into the question and answer area uh, and Dr. Terzillo will probably read some of those to us after we get through a couple of the pre-submitted questions. So with that, I am going to go ahead and see if I can get to these other questions now. You can see the nice background on my screen here. Um, all right, so I'm just going to leave this nice background up for you guys here and we're going to answer a few of these. One of the questions that we got um, was, please discuss the importance of the equine industry to the overall agricultural economy. Um, and I think that's a, you know, my last discussion uh, really plays into that quite well uh, because the horse industry has huge indirect uh, economic impacts. Uh, the forage industry is probably one of the greatest of those, right? So we talk about both hay production, uh, fresh forage production and the pasture that's required, but we can also talk about all the other feed resources and then all the other things that, that horses are involved in as far as, of course, there's the tack, there's the clothing industry, there's um, all of the shows that happen and the recreation that's associated with that. Um, so there are many ways uh, that the horse industry has a, a great impact on the agricultural economy. Brian, I think I'll give the next question to you. Okay, great. <laughs> so somebody asked, what is, says, what is your favorite horse breed? Uh, personally, my favorite breed is the quarter horse, uh, although, you know, I, I appreciate all good horses, no matter what breed they are, and really a good horse has nothing to do with the breed. But I think what's interesting is that our student base here at Penn State is represented by students who all kinds of breeds are their favorites, you know, and they come from a variety of backgrounds, and we're able to use the quarter horse here. Um, they're a little bit smaller, maybe a little bit calmer, a little bit slower, but our students are able to use those quarter horses to learn. It doesn't really matter what their favorite breed is. Um, and then somebody else asked, there's two questions that are pretty closely tied. One is, what is the appropriate age to start riding a horse under saddle? 
Um, you know, that's always a tough question to answer because depending upon how you do it, you know, I, I don't, I don't really see a problem. We start riding our horses when they're two years of age. Uh, we do not push them very hard and you do have to be cautious. Um, but there are other folks that believe that you should wait a little bit longer and I don't see anything wrong with that thought process either. A lot of that's really individualized, but also, you know, if you do it properly, I, I don't see a problem starting horses slowly at the age of two. And then somebody asked, what is the best technique for training a horse? Um, I, <laughs> best technique, that's a tough one. You know, really the best technique is the technique that works best for you um, as long as it's humane and proper. You know, we, we use a lot of um, pressure and release here at Penn State. Uh, negative reinforcement is the, the technical side of that. But again, I think it's really more, more determined by how you do something as to whether or not, whether it's the best or the worst. All right, so I think the next one's mine. Uh, so the question came in, how do you treat musculoskeletal problems in horses in the field? For example, and then muscle atrophy is brought up and how do you treat tendon injuries? Um, I wanna highlight here uh, that neither Brian nor I are veterinarians. Uh, and so our veterinarians are a very important uh, resource as far as the treatment of various uh, different diseases, various different mus musculoskeletal problems. Uh, we are lucky enough, uh, Dr. Ed Jedrodeski is our uh, farm manager. So we have a veterinarian that manages our horse farm here at Penn State. Uh, and that is an incredible resource for us um, as far as being, to have, being able to have appropriate care of our animals and all the things that we're able to do. Uh, having said that, musculoskeletal problems are a really interesting area that, that I am interested in from a research perspective. So I have done a lot of work studying uh, skeletal development, cartilage development, uh, thinking about how we can optimize that development so that we have healthy athletes, because of course, uh, that is absolutely critical to our horses. So I hope we get to continue uh, doing some of that research here at Penn State. Uh, the last question we're going to take is, uh, what kinds of research and studies are being done to feeding probiotic supplements to horses? Uh, and I chose this one because this is a, a really common question we get these days uh, as far as some of the supplements. Probiotics, just to, to be clear, um, are the feeding of microbial species to the horse uh, in the hopes that they're going to have some sort of benefit to their gastrointestinal health or perhaps uh, digestion of the diet um, or their performance. Uh, we have a faculty member here, Dr. Erica Gonda, who is in our department that specializes in the area of the microbiome, which is really, that could be the microbial species anywhere on the body, um, including within the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, and so there's opportunity to work directly with scientists like Dr. Gonda to study these kind of questions. We've not done anything specific looking at that. Uh, and I would say that my understanding of the research is there's some good information out there and there's still a lot that we have to learn uh, about probiotics. So with that, uh, I think we've answered some of the questions we got beforehand. Um, Dr. Terzillo, I think at this point, we'd be happy to maybe take a couple of questions uh, that have popped up in the, in the Q&A. Fantastic. So we do have quite a few questions that have popped up in the Q&A. So that indicates to me that people were interested in what um, you uh, two had to say. So first question is, are the animal science and equine science camps open to youth who are not active in 4-H or residents of Pennsylvania? I'll try to answer that one. Um... To the best of my knowledge, in order to participate in the 4-H camps, they have to be 4-H members. We don't have any we don't have any youth programs on campus that I'm aware of that are not associated with the 4-H. Uh, there's an FFA that comes up for the FFA judging contests and competitions, but for our 4-H science camp, I believe that's only for 4-H youth. I will also say at this point, Dr. Terzillo, that, and, and I know this may have been put into the chat, um, but we will be supplying the college with some links uh, to all of the different resources, many of the different resources that we've mentioned during the webinar today. So those will be either on the college's page associated with this College Connection video, or perhaps even in the YouTube area. So there'll be, again, a lot of resources where people can go and read about some of these things afterwards. And I know that there will be a link to all those 4-H resources. 
Great. Thank you both. Next question is, what is TEF hay? T-E-F-F. -F. What is TEF hay? That is a great question because, of course, I brought that up as a, as a part of the presentation. So TEF hay is a, it's a grass hay. Um, it's originally from Ethiopia, um, but it has actually gained quite a bit of popularity here in North America. Um, I originally did some work with TEF hay when I was down in Virginia, um, but it's also grown here in Pennsylvania now. And it is a, another possible forage source for horse owners. So many horse owners will know about Timothy or they'll know about orchard grass. Um, I would say for both our forage producers and for our equine producers, it's good to have a number of different forages that we can use because those different forages grow well under different conditions. Um, so for example, teff hay is good because it can oftentimes be rotated in with other crops. Uh, and so that creates some advantage for the forage producer um, for their ability to use it. It matures relatively quickly. So uh, for example, Timothy, you can only get a certain number of cuttings off of. With teff hay, uh, it matures relatively quickly so you can get a cutting off and then we could maybe rotate in another crop with it. Um, and our work here at Penn State showed that teff hay was first of all very palatable um, at a mid maturity or immature stage. Uh, it did get a little bit tough when you had it when it was really mature. Um, and it also had a nutrient makeup that was perfect for horses. So it had an excellent, excellent, you know, nutrients, vitamins, minerals, the crude protein content was all excellent for our horses. Um, so it's just another hay source that horse owners could feel comfortable if they see teff hay or have a forage producer that's making teff hay, that that is an option for them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question. How much interaction do you, and I assume this means Penn State in general, how much interaction do you have with the old order communities that use horses for primary transportation and hauling? You want to take that or do you want to? I think we can both take that a little bit. I mean, I, I would say from, uh, from my perspective, I have not had much interaction uh, there. Uh, that is not because, uh, I don't want to from a research perspective or can't do that. Um, it just, those opportunities haven't presented as much. I would say that we do have much more of those opportunities through our extension efforts and my efforts with Dr. Smarsh. Um, so there is, you know, I think the best way that we do that is when we actually get out in the field, uh, run some of our field days, when we run events like uh, our Ag Progress Days is where we see a lot of intersection uh, with those communities and an ability to transfer some of the knowledge that we have that we feel may be helpful to them. Yeah, I, I would agree 100% where we run into that is mostly in our extension. <clears throat> Uh, there have been some survey type research that has been done in the past that has you know reached out to those communities and and been able to you know use some of the data acquired through those communities to help us form needs and and desires in our community. Right, and I can add that uh, we do have an Amish hotline. This is a phone line that um, Penn State Extension has developed and utilizes to get information out to communities who, who do not utilize computers. Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, that was a great question. Next one is about parasites. What percentage of horses have parasites? And is the pharmaceutical industry aggressively pursuing new worm treatments? Um, so, Parasites are a natural part of the horse's environment. Uh, and so uh, I would say all horses uh, have exposure to and probably have some degree of parasites. Uh, of course, what we've learned is that uh, there's also different susceptibilities to parasites. So within our own herd and um, Dr. Jedrodeski here and um, Dr. Smarsh have both done work that shows that within our own herd here, we have high shedders and low shedders. Um, and by looking at those horses, you can't tell the difference between them. Um, and so this is where Dr. Smarsh's work uh, with, the, with the community and sort of teaching people to do fecal egg counts is really important. Um, as far as working with the pharmaceutical industry, uh, I don't think that there has been as much effort as there probably could be 
on dewormers um, and appropriate techniques there. So we are seeing growing resistance to many of the dewormers. And I don't think the horse is alone as far as our livestock species go and that problem. Uh, I think the difficulty there is probably larger than we can really tackle in this webinar from an, from an economic perspective. Um, but right now it's something that we all need to be aware of. And I think that what we try to communicate to horse owners is that it is our responsibility to work with the dewormers that we have now and do everything that we can to try to uh, reduce the growth in resistance uh, that we see. So that's, that's really what we have available to us right now. I also hope that some of the students that Brian and I are passing along to that do go on into the pharmaceutical industry and that sort of thing, maybe they'll carry some of this forward and, and think about some ways that we can actually improve things there. All right. All right. Next question um, is about research and extension. The equine industry is historically not as organized as some other commodity groups, such as poultry, dairy, et cetera, which often funds research to some degree. Can you think of ways the equine industry could work to support equine research and extension in the state? Uh, that is something that Brian and I and the entire team uh, probably talks about on, on, on a very regular basis. And, you know, I guess I would take this very special opportunity that we have to, to speak out to the world and, and to some of our uh, equine interested people out there and say, we are more than happy and excited to uh, collaborate uh, with the industry. We do need the equine industry's help. And, and I would very much like to see the, the equine industry do a better job of all working with one another um, to support. And again, it's not just Penn State. I would say it's many of our universities where unbiased and critically evaluating research can be done that will benefit the entire industry, will benefit not only that the companies that are out there, but also the individuals. So, you know, where is that money going to come from? Where is that funding going to come from? Yes, uh, perhaps the equine industry can support some of that by coming together. You know, I don't know whether it's through feed checkoffs or, or something like that. But I also think what's important is that uh, individuals that are out there uh, that have an interest know that we are happy to have their help. Uh, it would be great to have a conversation with some of those people and talk about how they might help to support both our educational programs that we have here and the students that are participating in that, but also those research efforts that is the sort of the seed and the foundation for the knowledge that we use for the education we can provide. You want to add anything to that? I uh, probably not, but you know, one of the things I think we see and, and the reason that we're a little bit less organized as an industry is because quarter horse people are quarter horse people and thoroughbred people are thoroughbred people and draft horse people are draft horse people and i think at the end of the day we forget we're all horse people and if we could all just kind of um work together in that respect and understand that you know, even though Penn State has quarter horses, the information we gain from those quarter horses can be applied just as readily to the thoroughbred industry as it can be to the draft horse industry. You know, and, and if if somehow we can break through that barrier of that mindset, then maybe some of that money will start to come together and realize that, you know, the breed itself is not as important as the overall industry. And that's, you know, with, with the dairy industry, it really doesn't matter which breed of dairy cow you have, the product is going to be milk. And so they want to look for milk production. You know, in the beef industry, it doesn't matter if you're raising Charlays or Angus cattle, you're looking at beef. So we are a little different in the horse industry. And, and if we could all just figure out a way to, to work together on that aspect, it, it would be a tremendous benefit. I think one of the things I'd like to highlight, Dr. Trezillo, is also... Um, more and more, we're looking at collaborative efforts with some of our other large partners in Pennsylvania. So, for example, reaching out to the University of Pennsylvania and New Bolton Center, where they have, you know, here in Pennsylvania, we have one of the premier large animal hospitals uh, that's represented there. And so we really complement one another very well, where they've got the clinical expertise and, you know, absolutely one of the top schools we have the expertise from a management perspective you know the day-to-day -day feeding the day-to-day -day training programs the behavioral aspects of things and so our two programs really complement one another very well so 
the, the Pennsylvania equine industry should be very proud of what they have within the state. Um, of course, both those programs uh, need support. Great. All right, the next question is about our upcoming quarter horse sale and the attendee would like to know how does the sale work? I'll take that bird if you don't mind. <laughs> you can go for it. <laughs> um, that's a great question. So I guess I give a little history. You know, this this is our 21st year of having a student run sale. Um, and up until COVID hit, it was always in a, a live sale uh, at the Ag Arena at the last Saturday of the semester. <clears throat> Since COVID, we've kind of pivoted to an online auction, but we are still having uh, an in-person event. We went back to having an in-person event last year. So the way the whole process will work is we're, we, we teach a marketing class in the spring and a training class in the spring. We'll talk about that primarily, but the marketing class is planning and preparing for the sale. The market or the training class is working with the horses. On April 29th, we'll have a preview where students will present the horses and People that are able to come to campus will have the opportunity to look at the horses, talk to students, talk to staff, talk to faculty about the individual animals. And then that day will the online auction will begin. The auction will run through ProHorseServices.com, which is um, uh, Stephanie and Mike Jennings uh, from Virginia, and they help us out with that. And then the sale will run basically from that, that Saturday morning until Tuesday, May 2nd. And I think, don't hold me to this, but I think the first lot will start to end at 7 p.m. that evening. And then it'll, it's a slow end to the to the auction. So lot number one, if somebody bids on that lot one minute before it's supposed to end, they actually extend the time to give other people the chance to bid. So that's how it works from the nuts and bolts of things. Um, people that are interested can reach out to me uh, and ask questions about the individual horses. We do try to accommodate if people want to come to campus prior to the sale to look at the horses. Obviously, we have to be cautious not to interfere with coursework and things like that, but we try to help out there. Um, people are encouraged to get on our website. We have a student run website where students are have already posted everything about all the horses. We just got professional pictures done last weekend. Um, you know, we talked about, and I failed to mention this earlier, but what I think one of the cool parts about our program is the student aspect, and the students are doing all of this. So last weekend, about 12 students gave up their last weekend to spring break, came back to campus and helped us um, get the horses clipped and bathed and banded, and um, and then we did professional pictures on Sunday. So uh, In 33-degree weather. In 33-degree <laughs> weather. It was a fantastic, <laughs> fantastic bonding opportunity. But... Those pictures will be placed on the website. We also do a lot of advertising through our Penn State Quarter Horse Facebook page, um, if you're on Facebook, so you can follow up with that and then contact me with any questions. Hope that answers that okay. Uh, I think I think that answered it just fine. Thank you. Um, next question is about safety. 4-H has strict rules for wearing a helmet. Are the college students in the program also required to wear helmets? So I will address that as well. Um, in our handling and training class, which is the class where the students actually um, handle the greener, the two-year-old horses all the time, they're required to wear a helmet anytime they're handling a horse. Um, in in our labs that we have for like our production and management class, we don't always require students to wear a helmet. Um, most of those labs are pretty um, mundane, for lack of a better term, as far as being around the horses. They aren't usually around the young, unbroke horses, uh, usually the older horses that are a lot more experienced. And they're not riding them. And they're not, oh, definitely yeah. not riding them. Right. No, 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 no. But even in our training class, even when they're handling the horses on yeah. the ground, um, they're required to wear a helmet. Uh, whether it be round penning or lunging or just handling the horses at hand, they have to wear a helmet at all times. Yep, definitely safety first. Next question, are you able to do surgeries on campus or do you have collaboration with any centers? 
So um, from a, I'll speak from a research perspective, and then you can certainly speak from a general animal care perspective. Um, so we do have a number of veterinarians that we can collaborate with on campus. Um, so uh, Dr. Ed Jedrzejewski, Dr. Jake Werner, um, that can certainly be resources for us if there are um, research surgeries that we would want to do. We really don't you know, over the years that I've been doing research, we really try to avoid, for the most part, any sort of really invasive uh, surgeries that we would do in regard to uh, any research studies that we're doing. So that's not really been something we've run into much. Um, from a research perspective, I also try my best to collaborate with some of our local veterinarians. Uh, and then, as I said, also uh, reaching out to New Bolton Center and working with some of the veterinarians there because we do have some mutual interests. In fact, I was just speaking with one of their veterinarians earlier this week about uh, some skeletal disorders and thinking about vitamin E and, and things like that. So th there's a lot of collaboration that happens from a veterinary perspective. From a herd management standpoint and a herd health standpoint, we don't do well, other than our normal what I'd call procedures and not surgeries. Dr. Ed uh, does all of our castrations and things like that. But when we have a surgery that would need to be done, we'll work with a variety of different places depending upon the nature of the surgery. We will work with Cornell, University of Pennsylvania, Brown, um, Brown's Equine Hospital down in Somerset. We send stuff. In fact, we just brought a young horse home from there a couple weeks back that had been kicked and had a sequestrum in his leg and had to have a small piece of bone removed. Um, for those types of things, we work with a variety of veterinary hospitals to try to get the best care that we can for each individual. Okay. And I think we have time for one more quick question. Does Penn State specialize in certain writing disciplines or are we open to most common disciplines in writing? It's a great question. So, you know, the, the on-campus program and our course program, we we sell all the horses when they're two, generally. So they're just getting started under saddle. We do use Western saddles because, quite frankly, they have a handle on them if they need it. But our horses are a variety of disciplines. We have hunter types, we have reining types, we have just regular Western style horses. Um, we don't really call us a Western program. We have students that really have expertise in all different areas. We do have equestrian teams that are run through our club sports program off campus. We have a Western team, a hunt seat team, and a dressage team. So we, we really do try to incorporate all of the different riding styles uh, in our program. Great. I wanna squeeze this one in. Why, why are horses called, why are the horses called quarter horses? Quarter. <laughs> That's a great That's question. That's a great question. Here's some good trivia for you. So a lot of people don't know that one, but you know, back in the colonial days, the cowboys on their days off would have get togethers and they would, uh, they would race their horses around town. Um, and most towns were about a quarter mile around. So these horses are built for short bursts of speed um, and they will excel in a quarter mile race. In fact, quarter horses are used in racing and in their races, they run for a quarter mile. So they're named quarter horse um, because they run really fast for a quarter of a mile, not because they're 25% as good as the rest of them. <laughs> it's amazing to think how the quarter horse has developed though into mm -hmm probably one of the breeds that is used for the <laughs> widest number of disciplines and all the different things it's done. You know, listening to Brian talk, um, my stepfather's bought a number of horses from our quarter horse sale here, and he's about as far from a Western rider <laughs> as it gets. Uh, and he's developed those horses for uh, eventing, uh, for uh, fox hunting, for dressage, um, and done so successfully. So, uh, the only thing he's a little disappointed by is the fact that we've gone to the online auction now. Now the horses are going for quite a bit more money than they did before. He used to be able to, to make a pretty good profit on some of them. So, yep, yep. Excellent. All right, with that, it's time to wrap things up. So thank you again, Mr. Egan and Dr. Stanier for joining us today and for your really excellent presentation. Next month at the College Connections webinar, we'll be learning about Penn State Extension's Master Gardener program. 
We'll be joined by Interim Master Gardener State Coordinator Andy Faust and Area Master Gardener Coordinator Valerie Sessler. They'll tell us about the Master Gardener program, training procedures, volunteer opportunities, and how you too can become a Master Gardener. To register for this session and for the May and June webinars, please go to our website, agsci.psu.edu backslash college connections. Thank you very much for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you soon. And on behalf of the College of Agricultural Sciences, we wish you a good afternoon. Bye-bye.